Well, welcome to another commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we're glad that you can join us. This webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force, and you can support CAF through membership or donations. And for information on how you can further CAF's mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you're watching the presentation, uh, this is a little unusual for us, but given the time difference between where I am and where our guest is, uh, we're actually recording this session. So as you're watching the uh, the broadcast today, uh, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type them in the comment box, uh, either on GoToWebinar, on uh, uh, YouTube, or Facebook, and uh, we'll forward those questions on to David, and we'll get him to, uh, to answer them later on and then post the uh, results back on social media. So it'll be a little bit of a time delay, but if you do have questions that we don't cover during the uh, broadcast, please just type those in and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can get you some good answers. So joining me now uh, from uh, just, just south of London, uh, we have uh, about a six hour time delay, so it's good afternoon for you, good morning for me, but uh, David Legg from the uh, Catalina Society, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, thanks very much, Steve, and uh, thank you too for inviting me to speak to you and your group. Um, so uh, my background is that uh, I've had a lifelong interest in aviation and almost a lifelong interest in Catalinas, uh, certainly since 1977. Um, I'm actively involved in one in the UK. Um, I fly in it as crew chief. Um, you can see there's some stats there about the flying that I've done. And I would just add on that that it sounds very impressive, but that's spread over 37 years mostly in uh, benign weather and with no one shooting at me so uh, that just puts those flights into context um, and what i plan to do this afternoon is uh, talk a little bit about the history of the catalina i'm very aware that uh, members of the commemorative air force will be only too familiar with catalinas uh, you've had quite a few over the years and i know that you're currently working on two into one in minnesota so as we say in england i don't want to teach you to suck eggs but uh, I'll give you a brief history of the Catalina, and then I'll talk about our operation, and I hope you'll find that interesting. So the first Catalina um, was actually built in Buffalo in New York. It first flew in March 1935. Here's a picture of it about to make its first flight uh, to enter into the water, and it's very recognizably uh, what became a PBY. Uh, the only difference really is the rudder shape, and that changed over time. It was the one component on the Catalina that perhaps was less successful and the design was changed and but the US Navy successfully operated um, quite a large number of them but by the 19 early 1940s it was pretty much obsolete and uh, co consolidated the constructor were going to destroy the jigs um, but Europe was at war Europe required uh, Catalinas and of course, the day of infamy, Pearl Harbor, meant that all of a sudden the US Navy really needed Catalinas. Um, so that picture is self-explanatory, really. Um, so the, the aircraft was put back into production. Um, and at around that same time, the uh, US Navy decided they would like to put wheels on it. So instead of it being a non-amphibious flying boat, it became an amphibious flying boat. And here's the prototype of uh, what became the PBY 5A. So you can see it's up on jacks, um, but it's also got its main undercarriage partially retracted. So this is the prototype. And so there were many hundreds of each version built, the pure flying boat and the amphibious flying boat. And uh, well, there's a typical um, hostile scenery, US Navy PBY 5A with its undercarriage clearly visible. Many hundreds, hundreds of these were operated, not only by the US Navy, but by all of the Allied Air Forces. And here's a random example. This one's a beautiful picture of a Royal New Zealand Air Force, non-amphibious Catalina at rest on the water. Um, they were also flown by the Australians, uh, the Canadians, uh, New Zealand, as I've mentioned. Um, and they were also supplied under Lend-Lease to the Soviet Union, as it was then. And this is a, a Soviet Union Catalina it's actually, um, this one is actually a, a Nomad, which was a, a modified version of the Catalina, not very successful. And the US Navy were actually quite glad to give theirs away to the Soviet Union. Um, but yeah, so the Soviet Union also produced some. So a little statistic, uh, the total number of Catalinas built, 3,281 in North America, that includes Canada and a further 24 were built under license in the Soviet Union. 
So a grand total of 3,305 airframes. And that is by far the greatest number of any flying boat ever built by a very considerable margin. And you can see here mass production. So um, now the RAF, obviously I'm biased, but the RAF were very successful operators of the Catalina. They flew them in every theater of operations in World War II, except arguably the Western Desert, although they did operate around the fringes. So this is just a typical early production RAF Catalina, no undercarriage. You can see the very distinctive big wing, uh, the gun blisters on the rear hull and the bow turret. Um, some notable actions. Uh, so it was an RAF Catalina that discovered the uh, Japanese fleet heading towards the island of Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka. And uh, the Japanese were intending to invade. Um, they were repulsed, but they were spotted by a Catalina. Uh, Churchill described that act, potential action as uh, the most dangerous moment. Um, they shadowed the Bismarck and uh, famously, as many of you will know, it was actually an American training captain that was on board the particular Catalina that first spotted the Bismarck, uh, kept quiet at the time uh, because the, the US hadn't actually entered Second World War at that stage. Uh, it was a very successful U-boat hunter. Uh, two Catalina captains gained the Victoria Cross. One, David Hornell in the Royal Canadian Air Force, sadly was a posthumous award. The other one, Flight Lieutenant John Cruikshank, is still with us, aged 102, the last surviving Royal Air Force Victoria Cross holder. And it goes without saying that also the US forces used the Catalinas very successfully in the Pacific and in the hostile environment of Alaska. Come the end of the war, uh, there was still a vast number of Catalinas around, um, not needed in such vast numbers, however. So many of them continued in military service and were supplied to smaller air forces around the world, particularly in Latin America and the Far East. But commercial examples were also converted for various uses, which the designers couldn't possibly have believe possible, I, I would imagine. And, and I would imagine they would be extremely surprised to find that there are still examples flying in 2022. Um, here's a typical uh, water bomber uh, for fighting forest fires. There are no Catalinas actively involved in that activity now. Um, this particular one was the very last water bombing Cat Catalina to be active, and it was based in Washington state. Uh, they were also used for aerial survey uh, for seeking out minerals. Um, this particular Catalina, if you look closely, it's got a stinger tail, a magnetometer underneath the tail. It's got aerials that run from the nose out to the wingtips and then back to the tail. And uh, a lot, quite a few Catalinas were used in this role. And uh, both the water bombing and the survey roles have led to the Catalina's longevity, really. A lot of today's survivors were used in these roles and kept active until the 1980s. And that's uh, just to interject there. That's that's also where uh, a number of the B-17s that are still uh, flying and and on display today sort of followed that that same route, uh, doing a lot of aerial mapping. Of uh, it, it's hard to imagine well, in 2022, but after World War II, there were still vast areas of the world that had not had detailed maps. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, like you said, with the uh, with uh, mapping and and uh, mineral rights and also the uh, fire bombing, these uh, these aircraft are, are around for us to. Uh, to enjoy still today. Yeah, it is amazing. And uh, we, we owe we owe those companies a debt, really. Um, I don't think they were using it with <laughs> air show operators in mind, but uh, that's how it turned out. So this particular Catalina that you see now, that's another former survey aircraft. Um, and this is the, uh, the first Catalina that we operated in the UK. Um, it's looking pretty shabby. That's because it's arriving in the UK in that picture, but it has just flown up from South Africa in eight days. And uh, that's where we acquired it. Um, it had been used as a survey plane by a Canadian company in South Africa. Um, for the very observant, you might notice that this particular Catalina and the previous one have been re-engined and they've actually got right cyclone engines rather than Pratt & Whitney twin wasps. So that's an extra 500 horsepower each side. Um, so we purchased this aeroplane in 1984, flew it to the UK in 1985, and it flew into RAF Manston in Kent, and I was there that day in 1985, and I've been continuously involved ever since. 
And we bought this aeroplane with the idea of operating it on the UK air, air show circuit. It was, it was acquired by two RAF fast jet pilots who fancied something different. So in very short time, we repainted it as an RAF Coastal Command Catalina. So here she is, the same aeroplane. In this particular photo, she's landing on salt water. Uh, we don't do that now, but we used to. It's very labor intensive. And uh, after a while, we painted it. Oh, no, sorry, I've jumped a slide. Uh, on, this is the same aeroplane, same color scheme and very distinctive London Tower Bridge in the background. And we're not an organization that has sought out sponsorship in any great way, but this, this particular flight onto the Thames was a sponsored flight for a company called Rule Plug. I don't know whether that means anything in America, but Rule Plugs are those little plastic things that you stick in walls and then screw shelves to. So, yeah, so in the UK, they're called Rule Plugs. It's a trade name and we did a, a job for them and we flew onto the Thames and then taxied all the way up to uh, Tower Bridge. And in fact, through Tower Bridge, that was a long time ago, but uh, same aeroplane. Uh, so after a while, we repainted it white um, for various reasons. It, it suits us to have a white aeroplane because you can overlay logos on it and they're visible if you have a short term sponsor. So we painted it in the colours of the Canadian Air Force Victoria Cross holder, David Hornell. And we flew it very successfully on the air show circuit throughout Europe. We also did a trip to South America for Peter Stuyvesant, the tobacco company. It was a competition and we flew their competition winners. Um, across the uh, the Atlantic um, to South America. And uh, this is the color scheme that we painted it in temporarily. Um, it was a very successful trip, apart from one engine failure, which was not so great, but uh, there was no danger, no, no one died, no one hurt, so all good. This is a um, fantastic picture of the aeroplane on the sea at uh, Fernando de Narona in Brazil, which was in fact a war wartime US Navy Catalina base. And I think we've got one more picture. Yeah, a lovely picture somewhere in the Caribbean. So although we mainly fly air shows, that's our bread and butter work. Uh, from time to time, we do other charters. And, and this, was, this was a big one. So we took it all the way to Latin America, up through the States and then back across uh, by the Northern route. Now, a bit of a sad picture this. That particular aeroplane, uh, we operated it successfully from 1985 until 1998. And uh, during July 98, we landed on the water in uh, Southampton and a component in the undercarriage bay failed. And when something fails in the undercarriage bay and you're doing something like 60 knots across the water, the outcome is not gonna be good. Um, and in this particular case, the, um, the, the airplane sank and uh, you can see it uh, sunk up to its wing. Uh, very sad, um, the airplane was um, damaged beyond economical repair. Um, but it, it had had a great innings. Um, so we had to decide what to do as an organization. Uh, do, do we call it a day? Do we say, okay, we've had a great time. That's the end of it. Or do we go around again? Uh, we decided to go around again, um, but in a very different way. The, as I said, the previous airplane was operated by two people and all the responsibility was on them. One of them was then sadly killed in an RAF fast jet crash. So all the responsibility was on one man. So the decision was taken, if we go around again, we're gonna do it differently. And so our current airplane, which you'll see in a few moments, is, um, is owned by shareholders, mostly pilots, not all, but mostly pilots. And there are 25 shareholders. And that means that you not only share the financial setup, but you also share all the responsibilities around paperwork, administration, everyone's committed. So we purchased another airplane in 2000, the, the owner of the aeroplane is Catalina Aircraft Limited. That's the group name for the shareholders. It's operated by the old company, which is still going, called Plain Sailing Air Displays Limited. Bit of a play on words there, which I'm sure won't be lost in translation. Um, and there's also the Catalina Society, which is like a fan club, and the members get the Catalina News, which, which I produce. So we sourced another aeroplane in Canada, in fact, on British Columbia, uh, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, which is about as far away from the UK as you can get really, um, we found this aeroplane um, and it had been operating with the Saskatchewan government water bombing service, hence the uh, bright colors. And uh, we purchased this aeroplane. It had had quite a few modifications to it, standard engines, 
but as you can see in this picture, big one piece non-standard blisters on the back, um, no nose turret. Um, so, but a lot of the work that had been done, it turned out hadn't been signed off by Transport Canada. So we had to arrange all of that, a lot of drawings to be signed off, a lot of money to be paid, but eventually we flew it to the UK in 2004 and it's been operating on the European air show circuit ever since. Lovely aeroplane, really good. We flew it with its Canadian registration and its old colours for a year on the UK circuit. So this is taken at a UK air show. And uh, I'm not sure how well this joke will translate, but a lot of people refer to it as the Rasta cat because of the, uh, the, the colours. So Rastafarians, Jamaicans, it's kind of, yeah, so okay. dreadlocks. So um, because of the colours, the, the sure. red, yellow and green, um, some people call it the Rasta cat. Not officially, but um, so this airplane um, did a lot of air shows in that color scheme before we painted it white. I'll explain why this particular color scheme a little bit later on in the presentation. So we very distinctive color scheme, um, very easy to see in the air, got lots of publicity from the media, lots of interest when we first repainted it. And um, yeah, so so basically what we do is the, the shareholder pilots, they fly it for fun, but obviously it's expensive. You know, fuel and oil is over a thousand pounds sterling an hour. Um, so we need to be paid. So we promote the airplane and we fly air shows all over Europe. We pretty much go anywhere so long as we're paid to do it. Um, so this particular shot is over Iceland, where we, we went up to Iceland in 2012 to do an air show for Iceland Air. A great trip. I, I took that photo. It's a brilliant trip to be on. Um, we uh, we occasionally take part in uh, fly pass. So this fly pass that's coming down in fact Tower Bridge again. Um, we're coming down the Thames, um, heading towards uh, the west end of London, and this is a celebration for the or commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic, in which Catalinas were very prominent. RAF Catalinas. So we had to fly down the Thames, but we had to follow the line. And anyone who knows what the Thames looks like vertically downwards will know that it's not straight. And there was a real wind, howling wind that day. So it's quite a struggle, believe it or not, to keep in, uh, keep in the center line of the Thames. We flew at 700 feet, which meant that we were lower than the top of the shard, which is the skyscraper you can see just below the starboard engine there. So that was a great trip. Um, that's the River Liffey in uh, Dublin, where we did another fly pass. And you, you can just about see us there, there's a shot from a helicopter. So although a lot of the air shows we do are standard air shows with eight or 10 minute uh, air show slots, uh, we also take part in quite unusual events. Um, uh, talking of Dublin, this is the Catalina taking off from uh, Western Airport in Dublin. Uh, we, did a, we did a round Britain trip um, this was attempted in 1913 by a very, very famous aviator called Harry Hawker, who later formed the Hawker Aircraft Company. Um, and he tried to do it in a seaplane and he crashed just north of Dublin and wrote the aeroplane off. Um, we've got an Aust Harry Hawker was Australian and we've got an Australian shareholder and he was determined that 100 years later we would emulate Harry Hawker's flight, but not so accurately that we crashed north of Dublin. So um, so this is us taking off from Western, really nice shot taken from a Hughes 269 helicopter. A um, little bit later on the flight, that's us going around Land's End, which is right down in the, the Western tip of uh, England. Um, great fun, we spread it over four days, Re really great trip to uh, take part in. Um, one of the places that we've been to quite a few times in Austria is Lake Wolfgang and uh, now and again we get visitors <laughs> and, uh, as you can see and uh, they're obviously taking a shortcut back to shore. I always say that uh, re real aviators dive not jump but uh, there we go. Uh, now I mentioned uh, John Cruikshank, uh, the Victoria Cross holder who's still with us at the age of 102. Um, he visited us uh, a few years back at an air show in his native Scotland. And uh, as you can see, the press were very interested to see him. Now, not only did he come and visit us um, and our Catalina, the, the type of flying boat that he got his Victoria Cross in, but we also took him flying. And it was an absolute honor for us to uh, take this man, very gentle 
quietly spoken man, take him up in a Catalina in which he gained his Victoria Cross and uh, give him one last flight in a Catalina. So that's flying over the River Tay at Dundee. And uh, I was I was crew chief on that day, and I'm proud to say in my logbook that I wrote under that flight, John Crookshank's crew chief. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, why, why not? Exactly. As you're doing, uh, you're going to air shows and things uh, around uh, England, Europe. Um, are, do you encounter a number of, of veterans of World War II, even some who have uh, experiences with the Catalina? Well, we used to. I mean, sadly, Tempest Fugit. We don't. Uh, we don't see so many now because uh, because of their age. You know, there, there are one or two still around, and but John's exceptional at 102. But but in the early days, yes, we did, and and they told us great stories. And uh, you know, we we were able to take a few of them flying back in the day. But that that era, sadly, is pretty much ended now. Uh, these guys, these are some Belgian, or well, the two guys in the middle are some Belgian politicians that we took flying when we did an air show in Belgium. Uh, for those that are interested, I'm the guy second from the left, the short one. Uh, so what else do we have? Ah, uh, yeah, so um, I said that mostly what we do is air shows, and that's what we call our bread and butter business. That That's how we we get by. And at the moment with COVID, that's not that easy. But um, but now and again, we, we get other jobs. And uh, we were asked to quote, to take a group of students, these guys from the UK to Greenland for an expedition, leave them there and then go back after three weeks, pick them up, hopefully the same number, bring them home again. And so this was called Operation World First. This was in 2015. Um, these are the guys who we took. and. Uh, this is in our hangar at our base at Duxford. And this was the first time they'd seen the plane. And uh, we uh, successfully flew them up to uh, Greenland via Iceland. Uh, for the, I mentioned about the white color scheme, which enables us to put other logos on. And so for this trip, uh, Worksop College, where these students came from, they devised their own airline livery. And uh, so we painted the plane up and uh, flew it up there. And this is this is our chief pilot, Paul Warren Wilson. And as you can see, that's an iceberg he's flying past up in Greenland. So, you know, US Navy pilots in the Second World War, that would be grist to the mill for them. But um, for us, pretty unusual. <laughs> um, but again, a really successful flight, no technical problems. We, we flew them via Iceland to Greenland. We left them in Greenland. Uh, they went off in, um, in fact, we actually ferried them out to a big lake and uh, we took, uh, as another view, we took them um, with some inflatable dinghies and outboard motors. They went out through the back blisters and we left them there. We took another party out later that day, left them there, flew the plane back to Iceland. And then three weeks later, flew, as I said, flew back to Greenland and uh, picked them up. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the Catalina on the lake in uh, Greenland. Oh, well, I suppose it's obvious, really, but um, being a remote lake, there are no boys to moor up to. Right. Um, and luckily, we had fairly benign weather, so we were able just to switch off and float about while the uh, the guys got out of the plane in their ribs. And what uh, what was the what was the expedition? What were they what were they you know, doing? Um, it's what I it's what we would call here an outward bound expedition. Okay. So character character forming. They were doing some mapping. They were doing some uh, mountain climbing, um, that kind of stuff. Um, avoiding polar bears, <laughs> and basically camping out for three weeks. Um, okay. So that's a great shot of one of the one of the inflatables with us flying over and the expedition leader on the right there. So that was a really successful trip and that kind of thing, if it goes well for us, we can make quite a lot of money out of that, which is all ploughed back into the aeroplane. Um, now, as a group, uh, we take flying and we take uh, safety very seriously. Um, but the fact is that we're either shareholders or volunteers. I'm a volunteer and uh, we go on all these trips and it's great to let off steam afterwards. You know, we're a closely knit group and um, we have we have a great time, but we do take it all very seriously when we're working. Uh, this is in France after a day of water operations, and I'm the nearest to the camera on the on the right hand side this time. Um, yeah, so other trips we've done are uh, this Lake Geneva, 
and obviously that's on a long lens so that column of water which is called the jet d'eau is not as near to us as it looks uh, but we were the first flying boat to land on lake geneva since 1948 when we did this this was this was around about 2000 and 2007 2008 i think um, so it had been a long time since any large flying boat had landed on G Lake Geneva. So that was a, a real thrill. There it is about to touch down. Uh, great photo. Uh, so so you, this is giving you some idea of the kind of trips that we do. And this is, uh, this is Austria again, Lake Wolfgang, where you saw the picture of the two young ladies diving off the wing earlier on. Um, and uh, just beautiful landscape i mean it's just unbelievably great place to go in a in a flying boat if the weather's good um yeah so uh okay so talking of water i, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um operating on water in a flying boat so we on a, with our current uh, catalina which is the one in this picture uh, we don't land on salt water because the we would i mean if, if spielberg came along and said i'm fed up with cgi i want a real airplane and i want you to land on water and i'll pay what it takes i'm sure we would do it but in the real world that doesn't happen and so we only land now on fresh water and it's still quite punishing you have to do a lot of dismantling of the undercarriage and the brakes afterwards to rinse everything out because unlike wartime it, you know it's a fairly unusual airplane and now are quite rare so we want to look after it but so we only use fresh water and we do quite a lot of our training on a big lake down in france uh, called lake biscarros which was a transatlantic pre-war flying boat base and uh, this is um this is us flying down one side of the lake uh, ready to do water landing so the next few slides i'll just talk you through what we do when we land on water so we at this stage we're just doing a reconnoiter making sure that the lake is clear no obstacles and uh, so we maneuver around on the lake and you can just if you look really closely you can just see that the wingtip floats are just about to come down uh, they're just parting company from the the main wing so the wings 104 foot wingspan with the floats up um, but it's kind of variable geometry it's uh, it's one of the few airplanes that can alter its wingspan in flight and uh, so the wing wingtip floats are just coming down here and the minimum height for putting the floats down and doing a, a turn above the water, we're probably talking between 300 and 200 feet, any lower than that. And we, we don't like to put the wings down in a turn close to the water. So, and in this picture, we're actually coming into land there, but the distinctive thing here is that you can see the wind lanes on the water. You can see lines of white foam or spray. And that's telling you that you're well in that picture you can tell that the catalina is absolutely into wind because it's parallel with those lines what it doesn't tell you is which way the wind's actually blowing is the wind behind you or in front of you so you have to tell that from other reference sources and you know research met research you've done before you go out on the water but basically that picture is showing the catalina absolutely lined up with the wind lanes so it's not doing a, a, a crosswind landing in other words um yeah and so this one is ju it's just coming in now the technique is that you s ideally you set up with a long approach so if you've got a nice long narrow lake you you set it up on a long approach um descent rate 150 feet per minute uh, you gradually reduce speed so you come down through 90 knots 85 knots and everything's set up and and i've landed on water as crew chief several hundred times and i know the mantra when it's when we're training off off by heart now and it's basically around wings level attitude speed attitude <laughs> wings level and and so on and the training captain will talk trainee pilots through it and they're the important things it's it's attitude which i'll explain in a moment it's wings level which is pretty obvious because you don't want to dig a float in and it's speed and touchdown speed is 72 knots um, and so there we are, we're, we're touching down there. Um, the hull is nicely slicing through the water. We've just gone through 72 knots. Both uh, wingtip floats are out of the water and that's the way they'll stay for as long as possible. They're only there to stabilize. They're not, not actually part of the landing equipment. Um, so really nice landing there. 
And this is another shot from a dinghy. This is actually a touch and go landing, but the principle's the same. And the really important thing to point out here is that the nose gear doors are out of the water. So, and this is where you come to attitude. Attitude is really important because the temptation for most pilots, unless they're tail dragger pilots, is to flare when they land. And you, and you do that when you land a Catalina on land. You do not do it when you land on water because if you flare, you will um, you will pour poise, which is very damaging and very uncomfortable. It's not good for the ego either, but it's uh, it's it's not great. However, conversely, if you get the attitude wrong and you put the nose down first, those nose wheel doors will just blow out, and the and the aircraft then will catastrophically decelerate, and it'll either water loop around or it'll somersault, and both of those will spoil everybody's day. Um, you, in fact, you may not walk away from an accident like that. So attitude is absolutely crucial. I uh, cannot emphasize that enough. So you do not flare. So once you're on the water, uh, you start taxiing. That's actually taxiing pretty slowly, but you, you've got to lose your inertia if you're gonna moor up to a buoy. Uh, does the word buoy mean something to you, Steve? I think yes. maybe in the state, you call it a buoy or, yep. yeah. So, so if you're gonna come up to a mooring buoy, the first thing you need to do is bleed off the speed. So this is one way of doing it. You just um, maneuver around. Uh, it also gets our trainee pilots to understand what maneuvering a big flying boat is like. Because the Catalina does not have a water rudder. So when you maneuver on water, you can only maneuver by airflow from the engines over the air rudder. But power means speed if you're on the water. But if you're coming up to a buoy, you don't want speed. So you need reliability, but you don't want speed. Sorry, you need maneuverability, but you don't want speed. So it's a real black art. And plus you're a boat and you've, you've got to sail the aeroplane. So you always approach a buoy um, downwind. So, um, so the buoy is floating on the surface and there'll be a trailing rope from the buoy trailing across the water towards the aeroplane. And it'll just have a small brightly colored float on the end. So we'll bleed off our speed and then we'll head off towards the buoy to moor up. So in this picture, which this was not taken in France, actually, this was taken on a lake in uh, northeast Poland. Um, so that's me coming out of the, uh, the circular hatch in the nose. So I've crawled between the pilot's legs underneath the instrument panel into what was the uh, original gun turret in the bow. I've um, unlatched um, a four point circular hatch. I've popped out through the top. And I'm about to, um, whilst holding on to the rim of the aperture, I'm about to slide down the side of the hull onto what's laughingly called the mooring platform, which is a very narrow metal um, shelf, if you like, on the side of the bow. So, um, so this is good fun. I quite <laughs> enjoy doing this. I'm not getting wet in that picture, in the, by the way. Uh, we've just crossed our bow wave, but the, the, the telephoto lens, if you like, is compressing. Um, the, the shot and so I, although it looked as if I was getting saturated I wasn't and this is literally a few seconds later where I'm a little bit higher out of the circular hatch and, and the bow wave has already subsided because we, we've taxied across it um, so this is I'm, I'm now looking out for the boy as is the captain who's on on my left hand side and uh, so this is yeah back in France, but the principle is the same. So you can now see that I'm crouched on the mooring platform, um, and uh, I'm holding um, a, a boat hook basically, and uh, my, which my colleague who's still in the hatch has passed to me, and we're just basically we're sitting there now waiting for the captain to do all the hard work, because there's there's nothing I can add to the party here at the moment. I'm I'm just there. Um, I don't want to fall in. Okay. But I'm just then ready to get the mooring line when the uh, captain gets me there. Interesting thing in this photo is that you can see that the main undercarriage gear is down. Now, we do not land with the wheels down because that would be, again, catastrophic. But on this particular Catalina, you can, you can isolate the hydraulics to each undercarriage leg. So what we do when we're taxiing slowly, because we need power but don't need speed, we can put the main gear down to act as a water brake and still have a bit more oomph and speed to get the rudder working. Um, but we don't put the nose gear down. We isolate the nose gear because you can bet your life that if you had the nose doors open, you would 
almost certainly foul the uh, mooring line and which, which we wouldn't want to do obviously so main gear is down acting as a brake and, and now so we're taxing off towards the buoy and yeah oh another occasion uh, where i'm dressed for summer <laughs> i wasn't expecting to do this and I, I i'm ashamed to say i don't have a life jacket on um i always wear a life jacket but this was the first time i'd ever done this and uh, i i didn't i had two hours warning so um yeah no life jacket but that is not our standard policy i said we take safety seriously yeah. we do so how, here how, i am again. how wide is that is that platform that you're standing on it's as wide as my foot okay which is why i've got one foot behind the other because there's not enough room to have them side by side um so you can see i've got the boat hook in my hand i'm sizing up the situation because it's my first ever time i'm being advised by our engineer and again we're just heading off towards the boy and there we go bingo my first time ever i've got the line um, but there's no time for self-congratulation because as you can see at this stage the engines are about to shut down actually but they're still going we have still got forward momentum here um, so i've got to get that rope off of the boat hook as quickly as possible hand it back to gary the engineer and then i've got to cleat that rope around the cleat hook which is just in front of my forward foot there my, my right hand foot you can see there's a cleating point and i've got to secure the airplane to that point um so that that is the object of the exercise the captain will shut the engines down as soon as he can see that i've got the rope um and he will take a gamble on me not falling in or dropping the rope which i'm glad to say i've never done so there, there we are again uh, that's my first ever attempt and uh, i'm finishing off the tying up and the engines are now stopped um, so great experience and I, I've done that quite a few times now um, the other thing about landing on water is if you go to a seaplane meeting you're not going to be the only seaplane there and so once you're moored up it's really important that you've got an exit strategy in fact if you fa if the mooring fails for any reason say we don't get close enough to the rope I, and I can't reach it even with my boat hook there's got to be an exit strategy so it, it's it's a high workload for the captain. Uh, he's got to be a pilot. He's got to be a sailor. He's, you know, he's he's really got to be very, very aware of what's going on. And you can see in this picture in Austria that there's quite a few aeroplanes around us, um, which all have to be avoided. And so once the job is done, you you end up with a cat's cradle of ropes. So that there's one rope there actually which you can't see, and then there are two tied to either side. So once the aeroplane is tied to the buoy we then use two onboard ropes to tie the buoy to the aeroplane. So you're secure in three places basically, and then you're secure. And if the wind changes, which it will, you will basically pivot around that buoy. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's a little lesson in uh, water operations. A little while ago, we, um, we put some nose art on the aeroplane, Miss Pickup, which is a, a double entendre um, uh, more than one meaning and uh, you can see that she just about lays on top of the water when it's calm uh, and there is a story to miss pick up which uh, i'll relate um, so there's another shot that's in austria um, and you can see you know there's three planes fairly close to us there um, but we're nicely tied up we're secure on the buoy um, all is good um, so that's that's back at Biscarros in France. We're actually doing a display there where there's a little creek which runs off the lake, which enables you to approach the, your display slot from behind the crowd without flying over them. So so it takes them by surprise, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's same same place but different side. So you can see us coming in. We've just flown down the creek and we're about to do a touch and go on the lake. Oh yeah, now this is interesting. Take, I mean, you know, the, the old guys, they'll have done this a lot of the time, but uh, it's pretty rare now to take a Catalina up a slipway. And uh, it's an interesting experience. And I think it, you can sum up that experience by saying, once you're committed, you're committed. Um, there's no way back. So you, you've absolutely got to center line it. I mean, this one's perfect. But you can see that that slipway is pretty narrow. 
you know, you've got a bit of scrub either side, and that's the edge of each side of the slipway. So that there's not there's not any room for error there. But, um, but that's an experience. Um, we haven't done that for quite a long time now, but um, yeah, we've done it in the past. Another picture. Um, and again, you can you can see from those two cleating points that there's not a great deal of room um, either side of the undercarriage as you come out of the water. I think there's one of it going back in. Oh no, no, it's not. Okay, so one of the crew chief's jobs to empty the bilges. Um, so uh, there are 13 um, hull plugs which have to be removed because uh, all boats leak. Flying boats are no exception. Uh, we have onboard bilge pumps, but um, water can build up in some of the inaccessible places. So that's that's a job of mine. Oh, there we are going back in. Lovely photo. Yes. What what kind of what kind of speed are you looking at? Uh to be able to come out of the, the water like that, or even to, to go back in? Um, is it a fairly slow taxi, or do you really have to uh, add a lot of power to get it up and out of the water? Yeah, good question. Well, you approach at not a fairly fast walking pace, okay. but once you know that you're centered um, and you're about to get onto the tarmac, you, you then power up, because it's actually quite steep. You know, there's quite a lot of weight there. So, excuse me. So, yeah, you use a fair amount of power to um, to get it up the ramp. Going back in is a bit more straightforward, but it's much more it's much easier to line it up going in as, than coming out. So, um, yeah, going going in is, is faster. That's sort of kind of a good, a fair old running speed, but coming out is uh, you know walking speed until you know that you're lined up and on the hard and then you need to power it to to um, get it up the slipway generally speaking water operations are, are harder on the engines there's a lot more throttle use um, so you use more fuel more oil and uh, it generally it's it's tougher on the engines and operating on on the hard so um yeah we, we so this is um this is a an ref era a wartime era lock in Northern Ireland that Catalina's used. And we went up there and did some really nice flying, but the weather wasn't so great as you can see, but uh, but nothing compared with what the World War II guys had to fly in. I mean, we are, you know, kind of um, fair weather flyers in a way, um, not because we're not capable of flying in bad weather, but you don't want to risk the airplane. You know, there, there's no need to do it. That's a, a view aft, la landing on Loch Erne in Northern Ireland. You can see the bad weather in the background. Um, oh yeah, that's another picture, a great picture of looking down on the aeroplane. That's another one of the uh, Dublin River Liffey fly pass photographs taken from a helicopter. And that really nicely shows the, the layout of the aeroplane. The floats are down in that picture, actually. We weren't landing on the River Liffey, they were just put down to show the crowd what it looked like with them down um, but big wide wing um, I'm sure most of you will know but it's worth pointing out the Catalina doesn't have flaps uh, it doesn't need them because it slows down of its own accord and it, it's a it's a high lift wing so and it's a good thing not to have flaps if you're operating on water because when they're down all that spray would be really damaging so it's um, if, it, if they're not necessary then you know don't design them in basically we do quite a lot of seaside air shows. This, this is again in Ireland, actually, but a place called Bray, and we're, we're displaying along the seafront there. And uh, I think quite a lot of people they expect us to land on the sea when we do shows. Um, and there's a number of reasons why we don't. Uh, one is the salt water thing, um, but also because you quite you can never guarantee what the wind's going to do. You know, you can get onshore winds which you're not going to want. Um, you also, although there aren't any in this picture, um, you often get quite a lot of spectators in boats, you know, and they're just going to get in the way. So although in a way it would seem to be an obvious thing to do to land on the water at a seafront air show, um, uh, we don't. But lakes we do and uh, now and again, like the one in Poland, we, we landed on the lake there and everybody could see us. Oh, well, that, well, that neatly illustrates my point about the boats, because that is the display area. We're flying down the display axis there, and it's absolutely full of boats. So there's no way that you could land anywhere remotely near the crowd. So there's no point in doing it. But you can get down low, and it, it looks terrific. There's another one. It's a great, um, coastal air shows are a great environment for flying a big flying boat, because you can maneuver it so that the crowds see it from every angle. 
here, another one. Yeah, beautiful. I, I guess that that must be taken from a cliff, I would imagine. But um, pretty good, pretty good shot. Floats down. Um, so we try and display the aeroplane to the best of our ability so that people can uh, see it from all angles. Uh, so we, we tend to do a figure of eight racetrack pattern and about two thirds of the way down, we'll put the floats down so that the crowd can see the change in um, setup. And then we'll put the floats up and put the gear down so that they can see the two aspects of, of the way it can land. So we, we like to think we give our money's worth. And uh, obviously these air show posters, you know, they, they've majored on the Catalina. Well, certainly two of them have there. Uh, the other one's got a yeah, beaver there as well by the looks of it. So we're a very popular air show act when there are air shows to go to. I'll come to that again in a minute. So I mentioned Miss Pickup um, and uh, the double meaning. So the original Catalina called Miss Pickup is not the one we have now. It was a wartime United States Army Air Force Catalina that was based in the UK and it used to do rescue missions uh, on the North Sea. And so Miss Pickup in one sense is picking up survivors from the water. And in another sense, you don't need me to explain that. Um, typical American art. And this is this is a picture of the original Miss Pickup 433915. And you can see the uh, the the logo um, just in front of or uh, just in front of the, the lift struts on the wing. Um, so we painted it up as this aeroplane in the second season that we had it in uh, 2005. But at that stage, we didn't have any pictures of the uh, the nose art. And then amazingly, within 10 days, we, we had two sets of original wartime photos turn up from totally different sources of the original Miss Pickup, which was incredible. And, and for me, who's a, you know, a Catalina nut, you know, that sort of thing, it just makes you weak, really. W-E-E-K, although <laughs> maybe W-E-A-K as well. Um, so here's a nice picture of an American airman with the original Miss Pickup and the original art. Um, so it was incredible good fortune. And there's another one of the crew. Um, so we were managed to we managed to replicate that uh, nose art. And uh, she's been on our plane ever since. Now that's the so the story is this is the original Miss Pickup. And uh, at the end of March 1945, she flew from her base in Suffolk, not very far from where we keep our aeroplane, to pick up a P-51 Mustang pilot who'd been shot down on the North Sea. And uh, they landed and one engine packed up. So the poor old Mustang pilot drifted off into captivity. He survived the war, but he, he was captured. The Catalina couldn't pick him up. And the Catalina was stuck on the water overnight um, because you can't take off from water on one engine. And so it was. It, they stayed on overnight, hoping to be rescued. Um, and then the following morning, uh, two Luftwaffe uh, ME262 jets flew in and uh, shot the plane up. So the rescuers had to take to their own dinghy. And that's a shot they took amazingly, I mean, of their aeroplane, the original Miss Pickup, about to sink. And uh, we thought this was a great story. Uh, the loss of that aeroplane is commemorated in the uh, Air Force Museum, the American Air Force Museum at our Duxford base. So we thought replicating our plane on this pickup was a really cool thing to do. Uh, so that's what we did. So that's the original. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll come back to that in a moment. So I'm getting towards the end now, but I, I've, I've alluded a couple of times to the fact that our bread and butter work is flying at air shows. And the fact that over the last two seasons, because of uh, COVID, the air, show, the air show industry in Europe and perhaps to a lesser extent, the States, I don't know, it's just basically fallen off a cliff. The, it, it almost ceased to exist, almost. Um, and so we've we've hardly done any shows at all. We've done a few, um, but nowhere near as many as we usually do. And at the end of 2020, while we were sort of wringing our hands and thinking, well, you know, where are we going with this? Uh, you know, what's the model gonna be? We, we landed two, separate film contracts and we get a lot of inquiries but 9.9 .9 out of 10 they're inquiries only and nothing ever happens and uh, but in 2020 in the autumn 
we had two contracts or two inquiries in a week that both turned into firm contracts absolutely amazing and we jumped at the possibility because or the opportunity because it meant money you know it meant making up for all the lost income from the absence of shows so the first filming we did was at a very famous RAF airfield called RAF Halton in Buckinghamshire and it was for an American series called Pennyworth which I have to say doesn't didn't mean much to me but apparently it's a Batman spin-off and I'm sure some people who will be watching this in a few days time it'll mean something to them it meant nothing to me at all <laughs> but they wanted us to do some filming so we went to Halton and you can see there's all, all this paraphernalia in the background film guys all wrapped up in their big puffer jackets and I don't even know what that thing in the background is I don't know whether it's a light board or a sound board I think it's a sound board but anyway we spent the best part of a week there really hard work doing nothing but but you know we, we we just had to move the plane from time to time and it always had to be in exactly the same position for continuity and we, we did one flight for them one five minute flight everything else was on the ground but that was all done absolutely brilliant um job done all paid for um so then we immediately went up to scotland to um loch ness um for the second bit of filming um so we we flew from halton to duxford we did a partial crew change i was lucky enough to be on both crews so i'm very fortunate flew it up to loch uh, to inverness and then the next day uh, we did some flying training on the lock, which is an amazing place to land a, a seaplane. Uh, you can see the, the kind of terrain that's in the background. Absolutely awesome. So we did some we did some training. Um, yeah, another great photo taken from someone on the on the, the hillside there. Um, really tremendous um, stuff. Uh, that's flying down the lock. That's our chief pilot. Um, so the plan here was that we would do a day's training and then the next day we would do a day's filming uh, for a tv program with a couple of well-known at least in the uk sportsmen um oh yeah, there's a lovely shot that's that's landing on loch ness and you can see the attitude there so the wings are absolutely level the nose gear doors are out of the water you're just putting the back end of the keel on the water and then decelerate so everything's great so the next day we we went filming and these are our two guys in the in the industry they're called the talent i didn't know this but they don't call them actors they're the talent and, and these two guys jamie redknapp who's on the left and freddie flintoff on the right they're both sportsmen um jamie redknapp's a footballer and freddie is a an ex-cricketer and they, they've now turned into well tv stars really and they were doing this thing called the Loch Ness to London challenge. And the first part of it was that we would pick them up on the lock, they'd pile on board, we'd go flying, we'd land a couple of times, and then we'd land on the lock. I would open up the side hatch, I'd order them off the aeroplane, and they would literally jump into the lock. They had uh, wetsuits on underneath these trackies, and they would swim to the shore. And that was it. And we had a film crew on board. So everything was great, it was all briefed. Uh, we picked them up, that was successful. We took them flying, that was successful. They got off the plane and jumped in, I ordered them off, that was successful. We then taxied out a little way to get rid of the, the film crew on board. And each time we, people got off, we had to shut the engines down because the engines are very close to the hull. So we got rid of the film crew, pressed the starter button, starboard engine, no go she wasn't going to play so here we are on a scottish lock very very deep very very long nowhere on the face of it to moor nowhere to beach it certainly nowhere to taxi out of the water it's one of those what the flipping heck do we do now moments and i, I was on board i was crew chief there were two pilots myself and one remaining cameraman and we were stuck on the lock, luckily in fairly good condi uh, weather conditions and nowhere to go. Um, very strange feeling. Um, <laughs> now I've mentioned our beautiful one piece blister turrets at the back, the, the, back, the black rib in the background of this photograph, he came out to try and help us. 
uh, get a line onto the back of the plane to tow us to safety and he just made a complete fiasco of it and he and he he smashed the um superstructure at the back of his rib against the side of the plane and took out the perspex so I mean, these blisters are almost unique so that that wasn't great so he disappeared and uh we <laughs> The, the, the strange thing about Loch Ness, although it's essentially a, a lake, an inland lake, it's got its own lifeboat service because it's such a big lock and you have pleasure boats on there that it has its own Royal National Lifeboat Institute crew and boat there. So we got on the mobile phone and phoned them up and said, are you busy? <laughs> um, come and rescue us. So this is almost like a, a rerun of the original Miss Pickup on the North Sea. We're a Catalina rescue plane that needs to be rescued. So we called up the RNLI and uh, they came out and eventually they got a, you can only tow a Catalina backwards on water. You, you can't tow it forward because it fishtails all over the place. It, it, it just, it's really difficult to do unless you've got a really big boat. So they eventually got a line on the tail. They towed us backwards and all the time it was getting darker. And, and they, they knew where there was one mooring buoy in, in Urquhart Bay. So they towed us there, it took about an hour and a half to get us there, by which time it was pitch dark. And uh, they just had a small searchlight on the on the lifeboat. And with their help, I moored it up and we had to leave it on the lock. And then think, where do we go from here? So we thought it was a failed starter motor, relatively simple to change on the water, provided you got the right equipment. So our engineer went up there, changed the starter motor, pressed the starter button, nothing. So at this point, we know we've got a really big problem. We've got a plane on a lock, which can have very changeable weather. And so, well, you can see what the result was. The only way around this to, was to do a, an on-site engine change, but off the water. So we had an 80 ton track uh, crane that came down the little lane that runs in front of these two houses. And uh, we, we had to lift the aeroplane off, off the, uh, the lock onto onto the um that tiny pier i'll just go back actually to that picture if that works you can see there's this tiny pier where the crane is and eventually uh, the catalina ended up perched on that pier with the tail sticking out over the water and uh, we did a complete engine change on on the starboard side and then got it put back onto the water and flew it home and this whole exercise took about six weeks wow it uh, cost a lot of money and and I would say at this point that we just as an experiment, we tried crowdfunding and 900 people contributed a total of 31,000 pounds. Absolutely extraordinary. It just yeah. it somehow captured people's imagination. We wouldn't have believed it was possible. We only did it as a, as a test, really. And so, yeah, so that's Miss Pickup. And that's the, the damage, it turned out, was an accessory drive shaft which links to the starter motor and you can see it's fractured. So there was absolutely no way that that engine was gonna, gonna start. So um, so yeah, that was our, our year of lockdown and Loch Ness, if you like. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a sorry end to a brilliant week. The good thing was we finished the job. So we got, it, the failure happened right at the end. So we got paid, but then we blew it all away on um, having to fix the aeroplane. So that's, I think yeah. that is the last slide. Oh, maybe one more. So yeah, that's just a bit of publicity if people are interested in the website for our society. But I hope that's given you a kind of taste for not only the original background to the, the, the Catalina, but our organization, the fun we have, the challenges we face. Um, it, it is just amazing. And I'm sure that when the plane was designed in 1934, no one would have dreamt that in 2022, there are still roughly 14 or 15 flying in the world. Um, we're the only one in Europe. But um, so, yeah, there we are. That's that's us. That's me. Yes. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you. <laughs> well, good. Well, uh, some questions actually have have popped up uh, as, mm -hmm. as we're uh, going through the, the presentation. First of all, with the last um, kind of story of the engine change uh, at Loch Ness. Uh, how do you source uh, how do you source parts and even information, technical information for making repairs or even uh, building uh, new parts uh, for the airplane? Sure. Um, 
technical information is not so bad. I mean, we've got all the original manuals, so everything's pretty well documented. Engine spares, again, not really a problem because um, they're Pratt & Whitney twin wasps. They were built, I think, probably the most built engine of any type. I'm, I'm, don't quote me on that, but I mean, they must have been built in their hundreds of thousands and DC3 engines, there's lots of them around. So engine spares are pretty easy to get. We use a, a brilliant engine shop in Idaho of all places, I'm a long way from the UK, but they, they do all our major overhauls. We do everything else, everything routine we do in house, but major overhauls and fault finding like on that engine, uh, they go to um, Anderson Aeromotive in Idaho. Um, the problem with spares is, tires are notoriously difficult to get and airframe spares so if if that uh, dinghy had smashed the side of the hull and not the blister it would have been a difficult task to replace these stringers and the longer ons that, that the aluminium skin is fastened to so it's basically a skeleton frame of an airplane and and those um those components they're quite complex um folded metal and you know we just don't have the equipment to to make that anymore so that that can be quite difficult um but everything else we fabricated emergency exits on the plane and that sort of stuff um so we've got a lot of in-house knowledge but we know where to go if it's beyond us uh it, with throughout your presentation i don't think there's there's a way to take a bad picture of a catalina uh <laughs> it, it's just a, it it looks great in the water and and in the air and it, is that part of the appeal of the airplane it, i mean it didn't have a very um uh, I, I guess glamorous role during the war. A lot of a lot of searching, search and rescue, obviously, but um, you know, hunting for U-boats, things like that. It was not a say a sexy fighter like a, a P-51 Mustang or or a Thunderbolt. But why do you think that the Catalina just remains an airplane that people just love to see? Yeah, well, you're right in what you say. I, I think I think because it's fairly unusual. I mean, there, there are very few flying boats flying air shows anymore, so people sit up and notice it. It's depending on what angle you look at it, it it's either a little bit on the ugly side or it's a little bit on the on the graceful side and we try and emphasize the graceful side so you know the fact that it's white it makes it look distinctive the fact that you can you know you can keep people entertained because you can put the floats down and you can put the gear down um it's the other thing is we can fly we can remain fairly close to the crowd when we're doing a show you know we, we don't need miles of airspace to turn around it, it, it can it can actually turn around pretty tightly um so you know we can maintain people's interest when they're watching it and it is and it's quite a big airplane as well so you know you, you can only put up with so many spitfires and mustangs charging around the sky and then it's nice you know great though they are um but it's really good to see something different and and there aren't that many i mean in the uk we've got, we've got a lancaster and we've got a b17 so we've got we've got the you know the big four-engined airplanes but big twin engine airplanes there aren't that many now we don't have any mitchells currently active in the uk for example so um yeah it, it's popular people stop what they're doing to watch it usually which is great and then of course on the ground we in normal times i.e non-covid um we try and get air show organizers to park us so that we're close to the crowd and and we can we can do you know, have people get do walkthroughs so they can see inside the aeroplane and you know and that's great that's really popular and then they'll say oh yeah i must look out for it when it flies later on today so yeah but it is it's a photogenic aeroplane for sure from most uh, to, <laughs> most, yes uh now it's, we're looking at still photography but and uh, you've had uh, a couple of uh, tv shows but um mm. are there any favorite movies of yours that uh, that feature catalina uh yeah i guess well i guess the classic one um is the, the remake of the film called Always, which has got the famous um, opening sequence where the water bombing Catalina drops down onto a lake and there's two old guys semi asleep in their little fishing dinghy and they suddenly realize this Catalina's boring down on them. Are, are you familiar with that one? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, that, that it's on Facebook all the time. Um, but yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, beyond that, I mean, yeah, the uh, Midway, I, there are some that aren't so great. Um, but been, I did an article actually for our magazine some years ago about PBYs in films. And it's quite surprising how many there are. Um, not not so much recent ones, but uh, yeah, there's quite a few old films where they they featured. Yeah. 
What about uh, corrosion? I, I know you mentioned that you don't land in salt water uh, anymore, obviously for uh, corrosion issues but just being in water itself uh, how I mean how long can the airplane actually stay on the water before you really have to start worrying about uh, corrosion setting in um, well fresh water generally isn't corrosive um, but we, we we very occasionally leave the airplane on the water overnight uh, when we used to do that uh, show out in Austria that I mentioned um, it was an evening air show so um, we would do our slot and then land on the water and leave it there overnight if the weather was good and that that's fine but you just you don't want lots of water sloshing around in the hull because if it builds up it's heavy apart from anything else um, and it you, you just don't want it there so but it but in itself fresh water is not corrosive but it does it does get in everywhere so you know people familiar with the Catalina will know that the main undercarriage sits on the the outside of the plane basically when it's retracted you know, it, it comes in two big apertures on the side of the hull, but it's basically all open. So all that brake mechanism, you know, and the, and the, the brake discs, you know, they all have to be dismantled. Um, but it, but times are different. You know, as I say, you go back to the veterans who flew them in uh, the, the, the Second World War and and they would say, well, what's the matter with you guys? You know, And they, they would leave them on the water for a long time. But I, I would just make the point in return to that, yeah, but there were 3,300 odd of them built. You know, they're pretty rare now. Yeah. So um, so as I say, salt water's a no-no, um, unless we paid a lot of money. If we, But when you do salt water, the thing is that because all boats leak, you're getting salt water on the inside of the hull. So it's not just a case of hosing it down from the outside. You, you've got to get all the floorboards up and really get in there and, you know, with lanolin and stuff and, and get it out because otherwise it will corrode we for major um but but aluminium does corrode anyway whether it's in water or not and ultimately so we we have um non-destructive testing process every winter where we would take certain key components off in rotation and have them ndt'd to make sure they're okay so principally that's the the, the undercarriage gear legs and the um uh, the the wing lift struts um so and plus we we check the um you know the wing surface and hull surface as well for anything that's obvious but we do ndt on certain key components yeah excellent and if someone is uh traveling to uh to uh, england and they'd like to see the airplane in person uh mm -hmm. you mentioned duxford yep. first of all explain what duxford is and then uh where they can actually see the uh the Catholic. Sure. so duxford's an old um RAF airfield. It was a Spitfire base during the Second World War, um, and it, it pretty much lapsed into uh, disuse. Although it was very active for the famous Battle of Britain movie at the end of the 60s, um, but beyond that, it, it it looks set to just return to nature really. And then a group of aviation enthusiasts started to restore the place, and eventually it was it was acquired by the Imperial War Museum which is a large institution in the UK. It has a large museum in central London um, and HMS Belfast on the Thames, but it, um, it also owns the site at Duxford. And so they have a lot of historic aircraft there. And they, over the years, they have welcomed in private owners like ourselves to base their aircraft there on the basis that it's something more for the punters to see so it expands the exhibits basically so we we actually get free hangerage in return for doing two or three free air shows every year so we don't charge our normal fee but in return we get free hangerage so we have a very good relationship so in the winter uh, the catalina will be there in the hangar and um, being worked on and it, it's visible to the public although they can't go inside it when it's being worked on in the summer it's usually outside at duxford unless of course it's elsewhere doing air shows so in a good year, it could be anywhere. It could be anywhere in Europe, from Iceland to Norway to central Turkey. You know, these are places we've been. So it spends quite a lot of time away. But um, both our website, which is shown on this final slide here as I speak, and also our Facebook pages, um, there are events tabs, which show where the plane is at any one time. And if it's not listed as being somewhere, the chances are it's uh, back at base. Sounds good. Any uh, final thoughts before we uh, wrap up today? No, I've really enjoyed. I mean, you've probably gathered I really enjoy talking about Catalinas. Um, and uh, I just hope that uh, your guys, 
in the commemorative air force have found that interesting as i say i know i know that the commemorative air force and previously the confederate air force have had a long association with kathleen it's not always a happy association it has to be said um but uh you know so it's a very familiar type a very popular in the states um so i hope that you guys have found it interesting and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you Yes, and well, thank you for taking time uh, to uh, share your your passion for the the Catalina with us. Uh, I learned a couple of new things today, so I uh, thank you for that. Uh, David Legg is uh, our guest. Uh, again, if you like more information, the uh, website is there, or uh, as you said, you can uh, find them on uh, Facebook as well. And uh, thank you for uh, for watching today. Now, if you have any suggestions for a future topic or airplane you'd like to find out more about, just drop an email to Leah Block at media at cifhq dot org. Again. Thank you, David, for uh, taking time today to talk to us about the Catalina. I'm Steve Buss, and you have yourself a good day. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Steve.